audience members was like, well, did you fully define your sketches? That's my opening story. How do you like that one? <laughs> did they sing the song to you? They, and they all started singing the song together. Yeah. That song's on YouTube, right? It is. What's the title gotta, of it? If someone wanted to search it, they they wanted to they wanted me just to play it over the speakers, but I said, you know, we got more important tips and tricks to get into here. Although I can't imagine there's a more important lesson to learn than to always fully define your sketches. Did so. Toby, you're kind of my SolidWorks hero, not only because you made a song about fully defining sketches, but also because you saved the day today. We had a cancellation, SolidWorks live design, like we can't pre-record this or anything like that, and you stepped in and filled the gap like a hero. Well, that's, that's too kind of you, Jordan, and I gotta say I have equal and mutual respect for you and all the amazing things you've done for the Stop. community over the yeah, years yeah, yeah. so it's really cool that we get to be here together do you remember when uh, you and i first met in person it was either at a uh, 3d experience training or a solvers world i think we met at solvers world before that you think you think so maybe that's possible but i but gotta that was say, like the first real interaction yeah the first I real always, hangout like, there's, that, there's that toby guy that does the uh, the fully defined sketch song <laughs> yeah we got to hang out it was at it was in pittsburgh i remember mm -hmm. it was uh it was solidworks it was uh you know before 3d experience but it was like the th the, the the tools that came before 3d experience we were getting trained on that we were getting already mm -hmm. ramped up way back then and i just remember having such a fun time uh i think it, it might have been uh Savocek's birthday yes and, uh, he had a sombrero we all, we all got to hang out and have a celebration yeah and i thought it was such a like i remember just you and i clicked and so uh, this is so cool to be able to do this event with you. This you know, is going to be think, fun. And I think this we is need gonna, to do more live events together. This is going to be like ultra live because this is completely unscripted. I haven't seen your model that you're modeling today. I don't know your workflow. So it's going to be filled with lots of spontaneity and surprises, I'm sure. <laughs> That's what I like about this live design is that, you know, it always is that way and we can always deviate a little bit. And maybe as I'm going through and showing these tips and tricks, maybe you'll be like, hey, Toby, you know, you could do this. Da, da, da. Like there's always you, new things to learn. Don't don't invite me to do that, man. <laughs> oh, <come laughs> you know how much I can blab on. Wow. This is all this is all your show today. I'm just here to uh, help along with the conversation and and let you know what's going on in the chat as well. So already people logging in and saying hi. So that's pretty exciting. We'll get started sure. pretty soon. But Toby, have you been watching the um, the Olympics at all? <laughs> wow, you really put me on the spot here. Uh, yeah, of course, every day. Um, and of course, I have several favorite events. But why don't you tell me some of your favorite events and Olympic moments? I... I haven't been watching too much of it, but I think I would have been watching way more of it or maybe even like training the past four years if uh, they would have like Toby, Too Tall Toby's Model Mania um, oh, yeah. as an event. Yeah, the modeling challenges. I think that's that's where we're going eventually. We're going to get there. We just got to keep keep petitioning the uh, Olympic Committee. We got 400,000 signatures on that petition so far. So I haven't know, I even think, seen it yet. Yeah, so I think we'll, send it my way. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> so uh yeah i just want to give a quick shout out to chuck what's up chuck thanks for tuning in to ch35t3r that's chester uh he's been in the live streams before what's up chester and ray is here old friend you know ray uh in the chat right jordan uh, yep. old friend old you friend bet. and steve is here as well from the ctsug users group what's up and andrew gross is here and tamper station another old friend of the show what's up thanks everybody for tuning in Great to see everybody again. I'm here too, Toby. I just and said in, hi. Okay, hi. Okay, good. Which <laughs> one are you? Cad Cad Paddock Tactic? Yep. You got any content on that channel? Nope. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. Yep. Well, I'm excited oh, to check it out. Brad Williamson's here too. What's oh, up, what's Brad? Up, Brad? Had an epic meeting with Brad yesterday. So great to see him in the chat as well. Well, listen, man, I think it's uh, it's just about time to get started. This is for everyone that's logged in. You've just logged into SolidWorks Live Design, where we take someone amazing, like Too Tall Toby, Toby Schnars. <laughs> um, and again, we don't even know what he's going to model today. He came in, swooped in, filled in for someone else that was a last minute cancellation. So this is going to be a really fun episode. 
where he's going to walk us through a pretty awesome model and tell us all kinds of tips and tricks. If you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the channel. This is a whole series, so you can go on our channel and check them out, all the past uh, SolidWorks Live designs. It's a super fun format. We appreciate it. We hope you do too. And without further ado, Toby, why don't you tell us what the heck you're going to model today? Well, thank you for that intro, Jordan. I like the way you uh, started out by saying you have no idea what I'm going to be working on, and then you hyped it up like he's got this super awesome model. Uh, so I, I, I don't know are, the workflow. I should have said, yeah, I don't know. I don't great, know how you're going to do it. You're such a great hype man, man. I'd have you anytime, <laughs> uh, anywhere, you know, as the opening act for sure. So. Thank you for that intro. What's up, everybody? Thanks a lot for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about surface modeling and SolidWorks. Now, this is really meant to be kind of like an intro workflow for those of you who are out there who maybe haven't done too much with surfacing. Jordan, I know you've done a lot with surfacing. Uh, you know I've done a lot with surfacing. I love surfacing, but I wanted to put together a presentation that would help people who want to kind of bridge the gap between solid modeling and surface modeling. So on the screen right now, what I've got is a coffee mug that I modeled last year in the, the uh, inaugural episode of SolidWorks Live Design. We went through the process of taking a coffee mug, taking some photographs of that coffee mug, uh, using those photographs to help with the layout of the handle, uh, and then modeling that up using just a physical coffee mug and using a measuring device. Like in my case, I always go to my trusty uh, digital caliper or a dial caliper. Uh, depending which one I happen to grab from the toolbox. So uh, we went through, we modeled up this coffee mug, you know, went through the process of going from a physical model to a digital model that is essentially at a one to one shape. Now, one of my good coworkers, Earl, said to me, like, that's great. That's a, a great start. But really, you know, I work a lot with the first robotics team. And what my teams need to understand is how to design custom parts around that existing physical part. So they have a part here, they have a part here, they need to coupling them together. You know, so they need to, to take all the advice and all the lessons from the coffee mug episode. They need to take a physical part and model it up at a one-to-one -one scale. But then what they really need to do is design a custom part that's gonna be machined or that's gonna be 3D printed. And they need to create some kind of a coupling between those two. So to get us started today, I wanted to kind of take a look at this coffee mug uh, that we modeled up last year and, and use the same example there. In fact, Earl actually said to me, you know, in the example of the coffee mug, let's say you needed to fit that into a cup holder. So I think that's a, that's a great example. That's a great starting point. So let's say we go out to our car. Um, I don't know. I'm driving a, a Porsche today. No, no. I'm driving a Lamborghini these days. Uh, Jordan, I don't know. What kind of car are you driving these days? Oh, um. Actually, I just got a truck, so I'll answer. I, I can't make a joke about that. Like okay. I couldn't think of something funnier than a Lamborghini, so um, or a more unbelievable than that. But yeah, I actually got a truck finally. I do a ton of construction, and I used to just cram everything into a van. Ridiculous. Nice. Like a family van. Yeah. <laughs> My wife hated it. I actually have a van as well. I have a, but I have a like giant, uh, like a delivery van kind of. It's pretty mm -hmm. epic, and uh, All it's. Right. Uh, I'm going to be driving around the country, picking everybody up and driving them all to SolidWorks World next year. So uh, maybe you'll get a chance to see that bad boy. Well, pick me up on the way, man. So let's say we go out to the uh, the Lamborghini van and we measure the cup holders there and we find that the existing cup holders in there are 115 millimeters in diameter. So they're not going to fit this handle. So what we could do is we could come into this model. We could say we're going to create a 3D printed part that's going to act as a coupling between this existing coffee mug and the existing cup holder because we can't fit our coffee mug into the cup holder. So maybe we, you know, take the depth measurement of that cup holder. Let's say it's 100. Let's just say it's 100 millimeters deep, and we're going to throw some draft on there as well. Now, since this is going to be its own part, uh, whether you do this as multi-body or whether you do it as an assembly, it's up to you. But since this is going to be its own part, we need to at least make sure that we don't merge the results. We don't want to merge this extrusion to the coffee mug. So we'll say don't merge results. All right, there we go. Now we've got this nice, you know, two two body, multi-body design. Here what I'm using is tab and shift tab. This was something that I think was added in 2014 for assemblies. Um, I don't remember when it was added for multi-body parts, but it's definitely a great shortcut to know about. You can just press tab on your keyboard to hide and shift tab to show. So you can that see That is here, one of my favorites. One other one that I'll throw in there, control shift tab. Okay. Will temporarily show all of the um, hidden components or bodies, oh. and then you could start clicking on them to show. So it's even Whoa. easier than the shift tab. I did not know that. 
Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Okay, I like that one. All right, cool. Thanks for thanks for telling me that. One. I'm going to start using that one. Control Shift Tab. Yeah, I like it. I'm going to use it right now. Well, it'll Ooh. only it'll only First show try. the hidden components, so you have to have things hidden. Yep. Right. Yep. No, I like it. All right, cool. So now we need to create the upper region of this thing. So maybe what we would do is start out by just, again, creating solid geometry. I mean, one of the biggest things that I teach people who are getting into surface design is it doesn't have to be explicitly surfaces. You know, you can you can and, and probably should use a combination of both surfaces and solids when you're uh, you, when you're designing using using surfacing like you, you could have solid geometry and surface geometry. So in this case, I'm going to do just a boss extrusion here. I'm going to come up, you know, maybe a little bit less than halfway through the handle here. Uh, and basically, I'm just trying to set myself up so that I've got an area that's going to grip the cup. And if I was worried about material, maybe I would make this more like a slot. I would kind of you know, tighten up this geometry a little bit. But for the sake of this example, I don't think that's necessary. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here to where it says feature scope. And so when it says feature scope, we can see here that uh, the feature scope is going to allow us to specify where the merge result is going to take place. So this merge result here and this feature scope, these are both uh, important and they work together when you're working with a solid extrusion. So I'm in a scenario where I've got a solid body up here and I've got a second solid body down here. And now what I need to do is I need to uh, uh, create a third solid body, but I actually want this to merge into the second solid body here. So I say merge results, but don't merge with everything. Don't merge with the coffee cup, only merge with this lower solid body here. Now there's other ways that we could do this. Like we could, we could maybe just say don't merge results and then we could combine them together later. But this is actually probably the more elegant solution is to use that option for merge results, but then come down here and don't say merge everything, just merge to a specific body. And there's other ways that you can use feature scope as well. It's a little different if you're doing a cut extrude. You know, there's other commands where it works a little differently. But when you're doing multi-body and you're doing an additional extrusion, that's how feature scope and merge results work together. So now what I need to do is I need to remove the material from the coffee mug. And this is where we start getting into the wonderful world of surfacing. So what we could do here with the coffee mug is we could come in here and we could use a command on our surfacing toolbar. Now, surfacing toolbar is not enabled currently. So I'll do a right mouse button, I'll go to tabs, and then I'll go in here to surfaces. And then when I go to the surfacing toolbar, I'm gonna use the command offset surface. So this is the first surfacing command that I'm introducing you to. It's very basic. It's kind of like a, when you're surfacing 101, just getting started, this is one of the first commands you learn about, but it's especially useful when you're trying to create any kind of a coupling. And that's really what we're doing here. We're trying to take two physical parts in the real world. We're trying to coupling them together with a new unique part that we're designing and that we're gonna 3D print. So I'll go here to this offset surface command. And when I go to the offset surface command, I'm gonna say that I wanna take this geometry here and I want to offset it. And I want to take this geometry here and I want to offset it. And this geometry here and I want to offset it. Now that just kind of looks like a blob right now because I'm offsetting <laughs> to 10 millimeters. So let me dial that down a little bit. Maybe I'll make it uh, say one millimeter. You know, that's that's probably pretty good. I think my, you know, you're going to learn over time what kind of tolerances your 3D printer can facilitate. For me, my, my go-to tolerance is 0 0.8 millimeters per surface. So that'd be 1.6 millimeters if you've got a surface on each side. Um, in mm -hmm. this case, I'm doing one full millimeter, so I'm going to have two millimeters of play total uh, because it's it's offset on both sides. And that's just what I know from my 3D printer. And, and if there's any, uh, you know, if there's any uh, deviation in that, it's something you just have to discover over time. It could depend on your printer. It could also depend on which material you're using within your printer. So for me, my go-to tolerance is 0 0.8 millimeters, but I'm going to do this one at one millimeter. Just give me a little bit more play on this thing. I'm going to offset these surfaces on the bottom here as well. And then I'm going to hit the green check mark. And so now I've created a third body in this design. If I look in the tree over here, I can see that I've got two solid bodies. So one of those solid bodies is the original coffee mug. One of those solid bodies is the coupling that I'm designing. And now I've got one surface body as well. And this is one of the biggest lessons that I teach my students when I'm you know, trying to explain to them how surfacing works. I say surfacing and multi-body design are one in the same like when you're doing surfacing you're doing multi-body design so mm -hmm. all the tricks that you learn in in like advanced part modeling and that training class or anything that you've learned along the way about multi-body design it's just going to continue to help you when you're doing surface design that's Especially a good point toby and it's funny because like i never really connected the dots like that it's so basic but like those are my two 
favorite modeling modes, multi-body and surfacing. I guess they are pretty much the same thing because you're building it chunk by chunk with uh, each surface. Yeah, they're definitely, you know, they're definitely related. They're definitely, you know, like, like for example, the tools that we just talked about, like using uh, tab to hide or using control shift tab to show all our bodies and then click and bring back certain bodies. You know, that's really a multi-body command. Uh, merge result and feature scope. Those are multi-body commands. So for example, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, what's called a cut with surface. Well, over here, I get to specify which solid bodies I want to cut with this surface because I've got two solid bodies. So all these multi-body tools that we see throughout SolidWorks, that we've learned throughout SolidWorks, they're going to absolutely be applicable here in the world of surface modeling. So let's hide that uh, that that caught the original coffee mug now. So I'll just hide that original coffee mug. And sometimes to make things a little bit easier, what I'll do is I'll go over into my appearance section and I'll go into plastic high gloss and I'll just grab a color from there. It doesn't really matter what color. And then I'll apply that to the body. So I did a drag and drop. And when I let go of that color on the surface body, I can choose to either apply it to the entire model, to the, the surface body, to the surface feature, or just to that face. So I'm gonna apply that to the surface body. And once I apply that to the surface body, you can see it just makes it a little bit easier for me to see what's going on with that surface body. If I hide the coupling, then you can see everything that's going on with that surface body. This is an exact copy of the coffee mug, but offset out to a distance of one millimeter across all those faces. So now what I can do is I can show the coupling again and I can go to the command insert cut with surface or here you can see it's on the surfacing toolbar cut with surface. And when I go to cut with surface, I can say that I only want to cut the coupling. I can say I want to use this surface as the cutting tool. So I'm telling SolidWorks to cut using the surface offset and to cut the coupling body. And when I hit the green check mark, we can see, or we can sort of see, uh, that that material has been removed from the area surrounding that surface. Voila. So, That's so going to be kind of hard to get that coffee cup out of there though, isn't it? It will indeed, yes. That That is going to be like a one-time usage 3D print. Um, maybe <laughs> if you wanted to permanently infuse uh, that to your coffee, you could, you could, your coffee mug, you could probably come up with some tricky uh, workflow. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the surface body. So I just clicked on it and pressed tab. I'm going to do a new sketch here on this top surface. And then I'm just going to go in here and maybe show, uh, show the hidden lines. And I'll take this line here and this line here and I'll convert them. So what I'm doing is I'm just setting myself up for a real quick cut extrude. And this probably isn't the most elegant way to solve this. We could actually, and, and we probably would actually do this with more surfacing tools. But I'm going to show you another more complicated example of working with surfacing. And so I figured this would just be kind of a good intro here. So I'm going to take that geometry. I'm going to do a cut extrude. I'm going to maybe say up to next. Let's see if that works for us. I'll go up to next here. I'll say I don't want it to affect all bodies. I just want it to affect this body. Let's see if that works for us. Okay, went a little too far, <laughs> went a little too far <laughs> with that one. I was hoping that one would maybe work a little bit smoother. Let me do a, well, you know what I could do here? There's a couple of different things I could do here, but again, just for sake of keeping this, this workflow moving, uh, moving forward smoothly, I'm just going to change it to a blind cut. I realize that I'm cheating here, but it's kind of a moot point anyway, because the reality of it is that I wouldn't really do it this way. Um, there's, there's actually some different tools that I would use to get this job done. But there we go, that looks pretty good. I think that's gonna give us what we need in order to take our coffee mug and to put our coffee mug into that uh, that coupling, like I said. So there we can see what the coffee mug looks like. There we can see with that nice two millimeters of offset. So it should be able to set in there pretty easily. Maybe if I wanted to uh, ensure that it doesn't fly around in, in the truck, uh, I could draft this surface here you know, draft that surface that's going down to where the coffee mug would sit in there. But more importantly, it's just a kind of a quick intro to help you understand what the workflow looks like when we go from working with a, a physical model to taking that physical model and designing it one-to-one -one inside of SolidWorks and then creating some complementary parts to that, a coupling, a box to fit the parts into, a lid, a cover, you know, whatever it is you need to do, this is a great way to get started. Instead of um, just, you know, what I could have done is I could have just taken the measurements of the mug and then tried to design that into this little coupling area. But, Ugh. you know, that would have been so much more complicated. It would have uh, been yeah. it would have been a lot more complicated to accomplish that. So, you know, this is this is going to give you a much better solution in a, in a quicker period of time. And it just kind of lets you look at it in the real world. And especially when you have curvy geometry like this, you know, how am I going to do that from from scratch? You know, it's it's going to be a pretty complicated process where if I've modeled up the coffee mug first, this is really going to set me up nicely uh, to see 
you know, to see the results that I'm looking for. And it's and it's uh, going to stay associative, right? So if you ever change the diameter of the cup or anything like that, um, yeah. it's it, it's going to update too because you're defining it by offsetting from those surfaces. And if those surfaces move, so will the offset surfaces. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, and, and so if I was to change the mug here to 72 millimeters and then I'll just run a control Q through the entire model, then we can see that that surface there uh, will also decrease. Oops, I think I did the interior of the mug. Let me try that again with the exterior. Here we go, 83, <laughs> let's bring that down to 81. And there we go, we see it comes in a little bit. Toby, you mentioned like the alternative workflow of like just taking measurements and then remodeling it all. And I guess, uh, I don't know, I don't know if you ever said this or, or you subscribe to this idea, but like my red light or alarm that always went off in my head is like, if I'm doing math, like, all right, this plus that would equal that, and then that's the dimension I put in. It's always like an alert that I'm doing something wrong. Like the software should be doing that for us always, right? Right. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. I mean, any anytime there's, there's been a lot of spots where I've modeled stuff up uh, and it's just I'm just modeling it just because I know it's going to make my life that much easier when I'm making the 3D printed part. In fact, I've got an example of that here uh, and I've got it here, actually, the physical model here behind me. So. The physical model here, I'll stay on camera just for a minute. The physical model here, what we can see is that what this is, is, uh, and Jordan, I think you know this about me. I've played in bands my whole life. And so uh, in, you know, maybe like five or 10 years ago, uh, I got a GoPro uh, Hero 2. So a nice old model of the GoPro. And it really didn't, didn't provide very good audio. Um, I really like the fisheye lens effect. I'd be able to see the whole band, and that was great. And it was great to review our results afterwards. But I didn't like the audio. It's crazy so, how big that thing looks now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty well. In fact, I even have the uh, adapter on the back for the the view screen because uh, okay. this one, you know, when All this one came so out, it didn't, it. doesn't even have the view screen. Yeah, <laughs> and so uh, and so then what I've got to augment that is I've got this uh, this little uh, it's a a zoom uh, recorder that you can use. To, uh, to 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 capture sound and it does a great job of capturing sound. And so what you can see here is that I was able to take those two and, and to put them together and to put them together in a way that like they're not going to fall apart and to even put them together in a way that I can easily run a cable here that goes from the headphone jack of the uh, microphone to the headphone jack of the of the camera. And so now what I end up with after the show is I end up with a nice audio recording that I can just output right to MP3 right from this device, but also a nice video and audio recording with the camera. So it was like a really good personalized solution to a challenge that I'm probably one of the only people that's running into, right? I'm the only person that happens to have this combination of equipment. And so I was able to put together this design. I was able to um, embed a, a hex nut on the bottom that's using a quarter 20 thread. So it fits right in with your standard camera mount. So this, you know, this really has worked out nicely and I've used this on tons and tons of shows um, and it's a, it's a, you know, a great solution and a great example of this idea of, you know, instead of taking the measurements off of each of those parts, what I'm doing is I'm taking the parts and I'm just modeling them up one to one inside of SolidWorks. And this one, I, you know, I took this on as more of like a, a, a personal challenge. So I'm flipping back over to SolidWorks here and I'm showing the the uh, assembly and then I'm going from the assembly here into the individual part model. So we can see here that when it comes to uh, the the uh, Hero 2 here, uh, this is, you know, like I said before, this is kind of an older model, but I just thought it'd be fun to really go nuts with this thing and model it up. I really didn't need this level of detail in order to facilitate the in-context assembly, but I just, uh, like I said, I just kind of wanted to take this on as a personal challenge. And then this model here, you know, c contrasting this to the detail in the Hero 2, this model here, you can see it's really just the basic geometry that I needed. Uh, I didn't have to go through and model all the buttons or anything like that. It's just kind of like a plain Jane model. But that really set me up nicely to then put those two together and to work from those models to create this third part, which is the, the custom 3D printed part. And so I just think that's a, a great practice to get into. You know, you've seen the coffee mug episodes. So now you kind of know how to take pictures and measurements off of a physical product and then turn that into a one-to-one -one 3D model. Now we're taking it to the next level where we're actually trying to use that 3D model, uh, uh, use those 3D models, those one-to-one -one 3D models to create a new unique part that maybe you could 3D print or get machined. 
So the other example I wanted to show you of kind of that same workflow is this, uh, and and I'm going to go back to my my camera here just for a second to show you what this thing is. So you, I'm sure you recognize that camera uh, on the uh, the model that I've got on screen there, Jordan. What's the camera okay. model? The C920 yes. Logitech. Yeah. Logitech C920, and uh, I've got another one here. Actually, this one is the next model up, the C920, whatever it's called, the streamer or whatever it is. Uh, but it's basically the exact same model. Um, a couple of little differences as far as functionality, but as far as the, the shape goes, it's basically the same. And so this model here- How does the camera work with that thing on, man? Yeah, well, it doesn't. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> like having a physical model like this is, is pretty reassuring when you can just put this right over the camera and then you know that you didn't accidentally leave your camera on and you know that like nobody else is accidentally <laughs> turning your camera on. Uh, you kind of know there. And you can see I even have a thing designed into this where I can like look through a little little mouse hole. Hey, everybody, how's everybody doing? Little mouse hole <laughs> cover there, uh, and then I can uh, I can show the whole thing. So uh, that's the that's kind of the point of this thing. And I also wanted to design it in a way that it would uh, work if I threw this into a bag. So you can see that I can go upside down with this thing. I can shake it around. It doesn't come off. So uh, that's useful. You won't scratch the lens or anything it. like that. You got it. It's kind of doubling as a lens protector. So uh, that's kind of what the the point of this this model was, and so in order to do that, you know, I had to have um, some pretty tight, uh, you know, sort of tight tolerancing. I had to kind of have this curvature on the back, like you can see when you look at this thing from a side view, the rear wall is not flat; it's a it's a curved wall there on the back, um, and then that way, when I put this on, it actually like holds on snug. Uh, also needed to be aware of where this little cable was here, and along the way, just from physical testing, ran into some stress issues that I was able to resolve during the 3D printing. So if I flip back to SolidWorks here, what I can see is uh, what this you know original model of the webcam looked like. And once again, you know, not not to sound like a repeating record here, but I'm using the same workflow. I use the same workflow all the time. So I take my my physical camera and I grab my caliper and I measure the, the dimensions, kind of the max dimensions on this camera, and I come up with a simple rectangle right on the origin with a distance of 90.4 and 24 millimeters. And then I roll forward and what's the next feature in the tree here? It's the image that I took looking down on the top of the camera using you know the tips the tips that we shared during the call. Wondering how you captured that curvature on the back side, the radius. It's a pain, right? Like yeah. if you're gonna sit there and take measurements on all that, it's a real pain. But if you just take a picture. You know, and and the proof is in the results. If you're able to get in there and you're able to uh, continuously like 3D print things that work, like that's where your proof is. You know, so the more you do this, the better you're going to get at it. The better you're going to get at like avoiding perspective when you're taking your pictures. The the more you're going to learn about kind of how much tolerance you have, how much range you have. So it's it's all about just practice, practice, practice. But you know, from there, I was able to create this shape. And like I said, I mean, measuring what that what this curve is doing back here. I mean, that's going to be a nightmare to try to measure that. But if you just have an image that you can basically trace, you know, then you're going to be in good shape. So if we awesome. look at the, if we look at this sketch here, Toby, uh, before you move on, what was your tip about avoiding perspective? Just get as far away from the object as you can without you losing it. too much resolution. You got it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah don't you know, and, and that's something that I showed with the coffee mug, um, you know, don't don't be right up on the coffee mug taking that picture. You know, you want to want to back off a little bit so that you don't end up in in perspective. So you don't want it like right here, right in front of the camera. You want to mm -hmm. be back a little bit, and that's especially if you were going to be trying to capture this view. If you if you needed to capture this circle for some reason, you know, you want to make sure that that's you're giving yourself enough range that you don't end up with a lot of perspective. So the higher resolution and the farther away that you could get from it, the better. You got it exactly. Yep, nice. you got it exactly. So now we've got this. Uh, now we've got this coffee mug, and and I mean, sorry. Now we've got this uh, 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 webcam up on the screen, <laughs> and that's especially important. Like if you look at the webcam, I mean, the the perimeter of the top of the webcam itself, you know, it, you're probably going to get that regardless of how far away you are. You're probably going to get something usable, but it's especially important when you have different levels of depth. So like, for example, with the webcam, you can see that I've got this rear section here of the webcam where the mount is. If for some reason I wanted to capture that as part of the design, that's when it's really going to become important to avoid as much perspective as you can. And then, of course, as you're, you know, as you're laying out this design, you don't just want to work to the picture. You also want to work to your measurements and you want to see, am I still getting, you know, what I expected? You know, I'm measuring it. I took a picture. I laid in the picture. You know, now I've got the measurements of this lower section. Are they way off? If they are, it's probably perspective, you know, mm -hmm. and you should trust your measurements, trust the caliper, maybe use this just to define the angle 
but don't use it so much for the location. That's a, another good trick. So um, lots of little tricks you learn as you're working from pictures. So now that we've got the uh, the the you know the the top view looking down, now the next challenge is to get the sweep shape. So you see how the camera kind of bulged out there. So and again, that's something where you're 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 using your caliper, you're using your engine engineering intuition, and then in this case, this is just a sweep. So you can see what the profile looks like. So just a little bulge there, and then running that bulge around uh, the entire camera to get that kind of bulge out. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't even model the parts at a true one to one. Sometimes you you oversize them or undersize them because you're able to anticipate how your 3D printer is going to react or especially how the material is going to react. Like how much give does the material have? If it's got a lot of give, maybe you want to make your parts a little bit bigger, you know, or, or make your tol you know, your offsets a little bit bigger or what or whatever in order to uh, really get that part to be snug so that it clamps on. What type of printer do you have, Toby? Like is it a typical FDM? Yep, FDM. Printer. So I have the Prusa MKS3. Uh, okay. And what uh, what do you find is like for you? What is the the general rule of thumb that you follow when sizing things? It, for you me, I try to like size the them at, offset or whatever. Yeah, but, I try to but size I mean, them at, at one to one, and then I do 0 0.8, 0 0.8 millimeter offset, um, and that works pretty well for me. I've had a lot of good results with that. Um, you know, and, but it, it depends on depends on a lot of things it depends on the size of the parts that you're building most of the parts that i'm building are you know roughly this size this is another 3d printed uh, set of parts that i've made uh, about the size of a soap uh, you know bar of soap uh so oh, you know soap tray? It's, it's soap tray yep so all right uh, designed entirely in x design so x design nice. to 3d printing proof of concept nice. uh so you know it's uh the, those that's about the size that i'm working with as you're working with larger parts you know tolerance becomes a little usually a little bit uh you get a larger tolerance right so it just depends on what you're doing cool i want to uh, 3d printed a uh, uh antenna cover for my car i i actually have a kia it's pretty fancy kia all stock mm -hmm. and uh when i was uh i was using a shovel to try to get snow off of my car because i had like 12 inches of snow in my car and i knocked the antenna cover off and so i was able to 3d print a new antenna cover um, if you ever buy a kia secondhand Make sure you look out for the antenna cover and see if it's got the striations indicating that it's 3D printed. That might have come from me. <laughs> I'm jealous of you, man. I got to get a 3D printer. I'm way behind the curve on that. Oh, yeah. Well, if you get one, I'll, I'll be happy to help you out with getting it set up and dialed in. Thanks, man. I usually just try to bum a 3D print off someone I know. So you might have to do that for me a couple times. <laughs> yeah, it would be, be like a reverse offer of help. <laughs> I like it. So now we look at this. Uh, now we look at this part here, the actual uh, part itself that we're going to be going through and modeling. And we see that it's got a lot more surface features than the earlier example where I showed you the coupling. You know, a lot of times we start out with a solid and we just use surfacing to kind of augment that solid. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going soup to nuts entirely a surface model. And this surface model was designed in the context of the assembly. We can tell that it's designed in context because of this symbol here, the little dash and then the greater than sign. So the first feature in this tree is a plane that exists at the same location as the top of the webcam. The second feature in this tree is me taking all the webcam surfaces and offsetting them by one millimeter. The next feature, I'm taking the entire webcam and I'm cutting it in half. Then I'm going to be doing a trim on the top of the webcam. Now, why am I doing that? Well, a lot of times when you offset from a curved surface, you get a little bit extra. You get a little bit more than you asked for. So you see how that offset up and it's not very clean. Like it started out nice and smooth and then it offset up. It's not very clean. Well, I don't want that. So I'm going to be using a, a plane to trim this geometry. And I'm going to go through this step by step in just a moment. So this is just kind of the preview. Uh, then what I've got is I've got a, a new surface that I've created as a planar surface. And then a lot of times what we do is we take those surfaces and we combine them together. That's called knit when you're working in surface modeling. So I'm knitting those together. And then what I've got is I've got a, a plane over here on this side because I don't necessarily want this to be closed off over here. You know, I want this thing to expand and 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 collapse in this direction. So I want I want it to expand in this direction as I clamp it over the top of the webcam. So that means I, I can't have this surface geometry here or else it's not going to be able to expand. It's just going to break. So I want to get rid of that extra geometry on the side to allow for that kind of a, a clamshell type of an effect. And then we can see here. That if we if we move forward, we can see that I'm able to uh, examine this kind of um, you know I call this the mouse hole. 
That's where I was looking through earlier and saying hello to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, then again, I'm, I'm cleaning up the bottom of the webcam because just like when I offset the top surfaces, the bottom surfaces are, are kind of funky down here. So I'm going to trim to a plane on the bottom of the webcam. And then finally, I'm going to add a, an opening on the rear here for the cord. And at this point, I'm pretty much ready to thicken this thing into a solid so I can send it to the 3D printer and I can I can 3D print this thing. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a weird face here. And this happens sometimes in surfacing when you're offsetting surfaces, you sometimes end up with some weird geometry. And so you sometimes need to do a little bit of cleanup, like maybe delete that face, create a new planar face and then trim that new planar face. So we'll kind of go through what that challenge looks like because that, that'll happen from time to time. Then we're going to thicken this thing out to two millimeters. Then we're going to uh, flatten the bottom again, because sometimes when you do a thicken, just like when you do an offset, you get a little bit of abnormalities. We're going to add a little bit of style to this thing, just for the sake of adding style, no other reason. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we are 3D printing this thing in this orientation. So the 3D printing is starting here and then working its way up. And so with that in mind, we have to be aware of what this angle is because different 3D printers can facilitate different what are called overhangs. So we have to be aware of kind of what that angle is so that we can 3D print it. But if you think about it, if we 3D printed it uh, in the other view, you know, so let's say I alt arrow key here, if we 3D printed it in this view, what we would have is we would have a problem with the overhang here. And so you end up with a lot of what are called supports. And I didn't want to end up with all those supports uh, because that's it's difficult to break off. And it, a lot of times it leaves sharp uh, uh, support material behind. And then you end up with that sharp support material potentially scratching the webcam lens. So I didn't want to print it in that direction. I wanted to print it, you know, what you might consider upside down. And so as I'm adding that style, I need to be aware of what my printer can actually handle as far as overhang goes. I think what my printer ended up doing was it ended up putting a support here. So that, well, a few supports here to support it in printing in that orientation, uh, which is fine. You know, I can break those off and I'm good to go. You know, Toby, what's funny about uh, surface modeling is that everyone is usually intimidated by it. Like I found so many people that are just like, ooh, surface modeling. It's it's tricky. It's hard. But you've renamed a lot of your features in your feature tree. But if you look at like the features on the toolbar up above, the names of them are exactly what you're saying. I need to thicken it. Guess what that feature is called? The thicken command. I need to create a planar surface. It's called planar surface. You know, like all these features are really basic, very logically named. And the UI of the property manager is like about as simple as can be too. You know, there's like only a couple selection boxes, maybe a couple check boxes, and it's very basic uh, features. Easy to learn, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's something that I've talked about a lot in uh, there's a lecture that I've given, you know, over the years and there's a couple different versions of it on YouTube. It's called Beginner Surfacing for Beginners. And that's exactly what I talk about. I talk about that idea of like you don't need to be like a heavy duty, you know, lofty, swoopy surfacing guy making like toys, you know, like uh, we, I often think of toys as like the most complicated surfacing challenges uh, that if you look at like one of your 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 kids toys or your nephew's toys, action figures, action like figures. That. Yeah. yeah, you'll you'll be like, wow, how the heck would you model this in SolidWorks, you know, and, and that's not that's not necessarily where you're going to get you know, the most bang for your buck from surfacing, doing simple things like this, removing the material of one part from another part with a pre-designated offset or with a non-uniform offset uh, is something that you can really get a lot of value out of by learning some basics of surfacing. So it doesn't always have to be that, you know, start from scratch, have a really complicated design. And, and hopefully after you see uh, this presentation today, you'll feel the same way. 100%. And actually, I think one of my favorite, um features is being uh, a question is being asked about it right now. Um, one audience member said, would delete and merge faces not have worked there? And looks like bridging without need for support. Yeah, so that's a good friend of mine, uh, Parjetter W. What's up, Parj? Great to see you. I could, uh, I, I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I'm glad you knew how. Yeah, first, I got it first try, you know, every time. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, Parj, it's a great question um, with regards to this uh, delete face, problem face delete. 
uh, and just using delete and merge. And uh, I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking through this model and I'm not really sure why I did this uh, the way that I did. Uh, you know, you could always look back at a feature in the tree and go to feature properties and you can figure out who created this and when they created it. So I can see here that I created this feature. Uh, looks like actually just last year, so I should be able to remember it. It was just the beginning of last year, uh, but for some reason I can't remember why I did it that way. So let's let's find out what the answer is. So if I go in here to delete face, there's this option for delete and patch. And when I use that option for delete and patch, what should happen is this surface should extend, this should extend, this should extend, and we should be in good shape. So if I use that, it says uh, face cannot be patched due to geometry condition. So there's something else going on. I suspect that something happened when I offset those surfaces to begin with uh, that yielded kind of an, an abnormal result. Uh, right here when I offset this from the original webcam, there was something that happened here. And we can look into this more as I go through the model, but that's going to happen sometimes, you know, and it's good to know what some of these workarounds are. And so uh, I'm glad that that was, you know, that was built into this model uh, that we were able to, you know, to kind of get through this. So we can see here uh, that to to finish out this model, we're just going to do a couple of final features here, a thicken, a mirror all. Let's see here, thicken a mirror all, um, a stylized fillet up top just for style, no no other reason really. Um, a little slot up here to help with st dissipating stresses uh, because when I first modeled this, it was solid up top and uh, it would it would break. I was breaking it as I was using it, you know, putting this on, taking this off, it was breaking. So that's just some stress relief up there. Uh, similarly, I threw a fillet on the inside corner here to help with stress relief as well. So a little one millimeter cor corner fillet there. And then finally, uh, just made the mouse hole opening a little bit smaller. It started out, it was a little bit too large and just made that a little bit smaller. I see Ivan's here as well. What's up, Ivan? How you doing? Welcome, welcome. And uh, YT SolidWorks 3D is here as well. Awesome. All right, cool. Whole crew's getting back together today on live design. I love it. All right, so let's get back into our uh, assembly. I just want to, I'm just going to toggle back to this model just for one more moment here because in the uh, in-context assembly example, what I'm going to be doing is building a brand new part. And so I'm going to be setting myself up nicely to then export that to a 3D printer. But in this example here, you can see that I've got multiple bodies. And so if I go to save this off to an STL or 3MF, it's not going to really be uh, a file that's going to be usable or it's going to potentially be problematic because of the multiple bodies. So all I have to do here at the end is I just go into the command insert features delete slash keep body. And you can even do this in the tree just by picking on the bodies and hitting delete. But I think it's always good to share the, the uh, pull down menu workflow. So if I go in here to insert features, delete slash copy, what I can do is I can delete the solid, the surface body and I can delete the solid body. And when I hit the green check mark, what I end up with in the tree here is I end up with a new feature down here in the tree. So this is kind of like doing a cut extrude to remove material. But instead of removing material, what I'm doing is I am removing those bodies. So the two bodies are here currently, and now those bodies are gone. They're still there historically. It's not like I went up here and deleted this you know, feature, because if I was to delete that feature, I'd lose all the downstream child features. So it's not like I'm deleting that feature, but instead what I'm doing is I'm just deleting those bodies so that I can then choose file, save as, and then save this as, uh, for example, an STL. Say this is an STL, uh, call this the uh, coffee mug coupling. And then I'm going to make sure that my STL settings are appropriate for my 3D printer. So maybe drive this uh, quality up a little bit here and save. And so now I'm going to be able to, to pre-process that in the 3D printer and uh, hopefully come up with a successful print. Probably I'll have some support here. You know, I'm always I'm always looking at uh, the situation with supports and always trying to do what I can to resolve that. Like sometimes in this spot, what you might do is you might uh, see see what you can get away with as far as a fillet is concerned. Because if I was to make a fillet like this, uh, then maybe the 3D printer could handle that uh, overhang and would be able to actually print that without needing any support. Uh, but maybe if I did that, then it wouldn't fit into the physical cup holder out in the car, right? So you have to kind of figure out what the balance is there. But I'm always trying to print without support if I can. Uh, generally speaking, you'll get cleaner prints with my printer anyway. Different for each <laughs> printer. <laughs> this is this is very helpful. Um, I won't have to ask you as many questions once I get one. Okay, good. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Okay, cool. Tamperor Station says, "Love in my printer. The world is in the palm of my hand." Yes, yes, indeed. 
All right, cool. So let's do this. So I'm going to hide this webcam cover that I created already. Uh, we've already looked at the uh, anatomy of the, the webcam itself, so we can uh, we can definitely just work right from here. I'm going to go to the command insert component new part. Uh, this is going to allow me to create a new part here. You'll notice that I'm working with what's called a virtual part for this new part, and I've got this green check mark, which is saying, uh, where do you want the origin of your new part to be and where do you want the front plane of your new part to be? Now, this is uh, this is like a fundamental of in-context assembly modeling, but it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand. It's a little bit difficult to explain, but basically where whatever planar face you select is going to become the location of the new front plane and the origin of the model who who owns that planar face will be projected to become the origin of your new part. Uh, this is something that I think is is very complicated, and a lot of times people uh, create situations that are overly complicated. So what I always would tell my students was, whenever you're doing an in-context model, just choose the front plane when the screen check mark comes up. Just choose the front plane of the assembly. And what that'll do is it'll just basically align your front top and right plane and origin with the front top and right plane and origin of the assembly. Even if you're not going to start sketching on the front plane, which we're not going to be doing here, uh, what that sets you up for is it just sets you up for a, a lot of success downstream. It's going to make make your life a lot easier uh, when it comes to designing in context. So uh, at this point, I'm ready to start creating my first feature. I see the red origin and uh, Jordan, a little bit of trivia for you here. Uh, uh -oh. What what does it mean when we see the red origin? What what does that mean? When what, what is the only time you will ever see the red origin? Whoa. Uh, I don't even know, man. You, I, stumping the expert. Don't you? Huh? Don't you? Don't. When do you not see the red origin? Do you only ever see the red origin when you're in sketch mode? That's oh well, yeah. Uh, of, I, I thought you. I thought that was the given. That you were, yeah, you were going beyond that. Okay, no, it's in, right, it's important, right. right? It's important to yes. know when you're in sketch mode That's and when true. you're not in sketch mode. So <laughs> just picking that face ended up putting me into sketch mode. And uh, that means that, you know, I'm currently ready to start sketching something. Well, I'm not going to be sketching anything. So I'm going to I'm going to jump out of sketch mode here. And I'm actually going to jump all the way out of even edit part mode because there's a couple of settings that I like to change because I'm kind of old school, but also because I just think it's functionally a little bit better. So I'm going to go here to my options and from my options, I'm going to go down to uh, colors. And in my colors, I'm going to change my assembly colors. I'm going to say that whenever I'm editing a part, I want that part to be not not the same color as an underdefined sketch entity. Uh, anything other than that would be fine. So I'm going to say edit and I'll just pick the very first color here in the tree, which is this kind of mauve color. And then for the parts that I'm not editing, I'm going to say that I want those to be this kind of yellow color. And in order for these settings to to be applied, I'm going to go down here to say use specified colors when editing parts in assembly. So I'll hit that little check mark there. Um, and then the final thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into display and I'm going to say that whenever I edit a part in the assembly, I want that part to be, I want all the parts to remain opaque. I don't want them to go transparent because if you think about it, I'm going to be grabbing a lot of faces off of this webcam. Whenever I edit this part, I don't really want that webcam to go transparent. I don't want it to be difficult to grab those faces. I want it to be easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my options there and from my options, I'm going to choose display. And I'm going to say, always make that opaque. Always make that assembly opaque. And so now when I go to edit this part, two things happen. One is that all the other parts that I'm not editing become this kind of mauve color, or I'm sorry, this kind of manila color. And the second thing that happens is um, uh, the, the all the other parts I'm not editing remain solid. So it makes it a lot easier for me to select geometry. Do you recommend that as your default settings? Do you keep it on like that all the time? How I work, yeah. Yep. Yes, I, I agree. I agree because I don't know if you're planning on getting to it, but there's some very easy ways to isolate if you don't want to see all those other components. And there's also ways to select past them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you one of my favorite tips. Yeah, one of my favorites to teach people is the select other. You know, for me, the way that, I know a lot of people use select other a little differently, but for me, the way that I use it is I right mouse button mm -hmm. and then I choose select other. You can get to it from left mouse button as well, either way. But I right mouse button and choose select other. And then that face that I right mouse buttoned on, it, it, it becomes invisible basically, or should. Um, and then if I continue to right mouse button, these other faces will become invisible. So uh, it's not right now for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> right, right when we tried to bring that up. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm just going to 
kind of like do a quick refresh, make sure everything is updating here. Let me try this again. Uh, so I do a right mouse button, select other, and I'm going to continue to right mouse button. And for some reason, these faces are wow. not not honoring that amazing tool that we were so excited to show. Try it again when you're at the top level. We'll save it for later. We can. Yeah, come back that sounds to like it. a great plan. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a great point, though. I mean, there are a lot of great tools for selecting through. Um, I can still select through. I mean, I wish that the, the, the faces were going invisible. They're not, but I can still select through. Um, so using select other, you can see here now I can pick that bottom face. And because I know how the tool works, uh, it's very easy for me to make that selection without having to rotate. So, yeah, I just uh, I like working with solids uh, and in solid mode, even when I'm editing in the context. I'll vouch for you that that does work, though, because I use that all the time. And you always just have to pay attention on in any property manager, any tool that you're using. That little mouse icon will tell you what the left click will do or the right click will do. A lot of times it'll be the green check mark, so you could easily exit out of a command um, just by right clicking. One of my favorites is like a full round fillet. You could left click, right click, left click, right click, and it will bump down the the selection box each time. So there's a lot of automation by using that right click. Yeah, I have a I have a, a couple of videos on that topic too, like with regards to uh, right, I call it, I think they're called right mouse button shortcuts or RMB shortcuts. I talk a lot about that, like learning how to just advance through those menus without having to go over into the tree here. So if you just yeah. search for some of those, uh, yeah, what, you know, RMB shortcuts, stuff like that, you'll, you'll find some good stuff there. Perfect. We can also see here um, what Parge was talking about uh, with regards to that kind of uh, rogue face here. You know, and one thing that we talked about when it comes to that rogue face was we talked about maybe um, uh, doing a delete face and a delete emerge. You know, maybe what we could do here is we could do a delete face here. So insert face delete. And then we could do a delete and patch and see that cleaned that up. And that would actually probably set me up for later on having more success when it comes to doing those offset surfaces. So that could be kind of a proactive measure you could take to ensure uh, or to, to, to diminish the number of additional steps you have to take when it comes to cleanup. So I think that's that's kind of a cool thing and, and a cool example of using that um, uh, delete face and then using delete and patch. I think I'm gonna just leave that in there and uh, move forward with my design and I'll just work on that side of the model instead. So I'm gonna go in here to edit part. Now I'm working with this new part where we're doing the surface offset. And I'm gonna start out by going in here to my surfacing commands, doing my offset surface. I'm gonna start out by uh, just offsetting this at a distance of one millimeter. I'm gonna give myself one millimeter clearance on this design. And I'll offset this very front face, this face wrapping around here, and then these rear faces here as well. And I'm just gonna model half of the model. So I don't have to worry about you know any additional faces beyond what I've done there. I hit the green check mark. And now I'm going to go into a plane command. So insert reference geometry plane. A lot of times I get to that from my S key. So S key reference geometry plane. And I'm going to offset this plane, this planar surface at a distance of zero. So now I've got a plane that's exactly at the top of the model. So this first feature might be like offset to one millimeter. And then this next feature here would be uh, top plane of webcam. And then I'll do another, uh, another uh, 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 that same command again. Insert reference geometry plane pick this surface here, distance of zero, and that's gonna be my bottom surface of plane. That, that's one of the little Easter eggs. Um, if you offset, use the offset surface command and set it to zero, it actually changes the name of the feature to copy surface. Yes. That's Which a, that's I always another. thought was bizarre, but yeah. kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, kind of like, like you said, like a little Easter egg, a little uh, hidden gem that's, that's from the old days of, of uh, coding. <laughs> And so now what I've got is I've got my model kind of at a good spot. You can see it's offset from the webcam there uh, at, a, at a relatively good distance. And but it's but it's got some problems with the offset itself. Like see how the offset is getting like real funky here up at the top. And so I'm going to use that plane that I created to, to clean that up, clean up that little that little offset there. Let me turn off some of this, uh, the graphical settings here just to make it a little bit easier to see. Sometimes I'll also change my uh, my backdrop here from uh, gradient to plain white that also will often help to brighten up the scene a little bit. And so I'm going to take that planar surface that I created and I'm going to use a command here called trim surface. So up to this point, all we've really talked about is we've only talked about the use of offset surface. When we did the earlier example, that's all we really showed. But now we're going to introduce another command called trim surface. And this is kind of like cut when you're in solid modeling, but we're using trim when we're in surface modeling. 
And so you have to specify a trim tool. Now I pre-selected that top plane. So that's gonna be my trimming tool. And then down here, this is kind of unique to surfacing. I could say that I either wanna keep this region up top here, where it's highlighted in magenta right now, or this region down below here, highlighted in magenta now. So you can declare which side you wanna keep, which side you wanna get rid of. Or if you wanted to, you could use this radio button here to say, you know, get rid of, remove. But I'm gonna say, keep this lower section hit the green check mark, and now you can see I've got that nice smooth top. And what'll happen is if you don't do that, you'll you'll run into problems later, particularly when you try to thicken this model. So if I say I wanna thicken this out to two millimeters, so there's my thicken out to two millimeters, I'm taking a surface and turning it into a solid. Well, that's not what we want, right? We don't wanna end up with like a weird, you know, whatever that is, whatever's going on there, we don't wanna end <laughs> up with that. So that's kind of where you'll you'll see that, uh, that, that cleanup pay off downstream. And I can't tell you how important that little radio button is to choose to keep the surfaces rather than remove them or vice versa, because sometimes you're you're trimming away something that's like really, really hard to click on and you, you don't want to click just remove it because it's you, you just can't get in there. It's internal to the geometry and just picking the external shell that you want to keep. It works so easily. I think we added that. I don't know when we added that. It might have been longer ago, but like even with the delete bodies uh, for cleaning up before a 3D print or something like that, there's also the keep bodies option now. And I think we added that like in the past like couple of years or so, a few years, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great point. And it's something that where like a lot of times it's just convenience. Like it's it's easier for me to select here and keep than it is to select down here and remove. Um, but sometimes it's actually functional, like the, like when, especially when you have multiple nested contours or you've got multiple overlaps, like one of them actually won't work and the other one will. Uh, so it, it, uh, in the beginning, when you first start doing surfacing, you, you think it's just a convenience, but it actually ends up becoming really important and actually functional eventually. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do one more trim here. So now I've trimmed the bottom to clean that up. I'm going to do one more trim here, and this is going to be a trim from this mid plane. And I'm going to say I want to keep selections. You notice here, if I do remove selections, I have to pick two different surfaces, right? But if I do keep selections, then I only need to pick one. So that's an example of it being just a little more convenient. And now I've basically cut this thing in half. So we'll call that one cut in half. So now we're ready to uh, start creating kind of the lid for this thing. And so I'm going to go back to that surface, uh, that plane that I created up top, the top plane of webcam, begin a sketch. I could maybe hide this uh, model if I, you know, if, if I felt like it was getting in the way at all, I could just hide that model, but I don't think it's really going to be getting in the way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to right mouse button here and I'm going to choose select tangency. And that gets all those edges over to that side so I can do a convert entities. And then I'll finish off by just picking this edge here, convert entities, and then bridging across here with a single line. And now that I've got that single line bridged across, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that I want to go to surfaces, planar surface. And I just wanna take all that surface geometry or that sketch geometry and fill it in. It's a closed sketch contour. So I just wanna fill it in with a planar surface. So now that I've got that geometry uh, kind of filled in with that planar surface, what I can do is I can perform what's called a knit command. Now, what a knit command lets you do is it lets you take two different surface bodies and merge them together into one single surface body. And this will be important because I'm planning on thickening this. I don't just want to thicken this lower region. I want to thicken the whole thing all at once. And so when I do thicken, you can see I've, I can only select one surface at a time. So I can either thicken that or I can thicken that. I want to really thicken them together. Now, one thing that I often get asked when it comes to the knit surface command is, why don't you use create solid as part of the knit surface command. You know, when you've got an enclosed volume, a watertight surface, you can both knit it and you can combine it in one step. And my answer is always because I like my feature, I don't mind my feature tree having extra features if it's easier to dissect. And a knit does, does not always necessitate a thicken. And this is a good example of where that's happening. I'm knitting these two surfaces together, but it's for another purpose. You know, it's because I, I, when I do a trim, I want that trim to kind of encompass everything or it's, you know, there's other reasons why you might knit a surface. Uh, so in this case, I'm doing a knit, but I'm not thickening. And because of that, I just kind of always segregate the two commands. Um, even though a lot of times, you know, my feature tree looks like knit surface and then thicken into solid, uh, there's enough times where it doesn't that I just like to have them separate. A knit does not necessitate a thicken for me. So I just keep them uh, as two different explicit commands. You know, talking about uh, your modeling strategy, Toby, um, we had another question from 
Pardster W. Yep. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, you um, nailed it. He goes, uh, I know this is a surfacing stream, but why not make this as a solid? Just fill in the top, bottom, and mid plane with planar surfaces and then make the solid from the enclosed volume, then Boolean subtract. So that is an option, I'm sure, but um, I'm sure you're trying. This is like a great example of like an introduction to to surfacing, and there's many ways to to do this. But you wanna you wanna expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, when you start working with surfacing a lot, what you realize is that being able to just do one face at a time um, is often a a faster, albeit a brute force solution to challenges you're running into. Uh, for me personally, I'm a family man. So I am always up against the clock. Uh, you know, my kid, I have like these little 15 minute windows uh, between like where uh, my wife is like, you know, shuttling the kids somewhere and they're going to be back. And I'm like, I need to make a webcam cover. And so I just kind of brute force my way through. So a lot of times you could model something in surfacing. You can model something in solids. Uh, there's times when like it just makes way more sense to do it with surfacing. Uh, I'd have to really beat this one up to see if uh, if that would qualify. I think you'd probably run into some challenges with um offsetting the the solid to use the solid for a boolean subtract uh because it wouldn't necessarily extend out far enough but uh i'd have to really beat it up to find out yeah, yeah I, th I think that's an important uh tip too right like it's not always about how few of features can you model something in right yes. sometimes sometimes i fall into that like wormhole where i'm like oh can i do this faster and i'll like overanalyze how I'm about to do something and by the time like if I just did more features I would have been done with the model rather than just rethinking how I should do it over and over yep. again so, so speaking of uh, that that idea of being kind of up against the clock I feel like we're kind of running into that same challenge we, here, I was just be, about to say that too, the clock, we yep. can go over a little bit this is great keep on going as, okay no problem as long as we go like no more than like 10 or 15 minutes over I think we're cool okay that sounds good like a good plan so you can see here that my net for my next feature, what I'm doing is I'm just taking this plane, this right plane. So I'm clicking on the right plane, taking my mouse over, and I'm holding control, and then I'm dragging that plane over. And so what that's going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to offset a certain distance. In this case, I'm going to go you know, 34, 35 millimeters so that I get a little bit of the curvature here from the model. Um, so we can see here where that that planar, uh, planar surface is again. Uh, so I get you know a little bit of of uh, this curve here from the model, but I'm able to cut off the rest of the model so that I don't end up with those stresses that I mentioned earlier. You know, I want this thing to to kind of clamshell outward. I want it to be able to flex. And so I can't have can't have it enclosed on the sides or else it's not going to be able to flex like that. So I'm going to go in here to my uh, uh, trim command once again. I'm going to say that I want to trim this surface and that I want to keep this inner region. Here you can see where that knit is paying off because I don't need to go through and do the trim twice, you know, or pick two different surfaces. Since those surfaces are knit together, it's one single knit surface that I can then trim away using a plane. So trimming is, is kind of like doing cuts when you're in solid mode, but you use another tool. And sometimes you actually use another surface to facilitate the trim, which is pretty cool. It can, it can allow you to do some really cool swoopy, lofty, uh, multi-intersecting surfaces to get your trimmed results. But for this example, just kind of a simple example, there we can see, you know, this is looking pretty good and I can go back and I can show the webcam and you can see now how this is going to, this is going to cup around the webcam and it's going to hold onto the webcam to allow it to, you know, to flip around, to roll around in my bag and it's not going to just fly off. And that's, that's part of what I wanted as part of my design intent. So now that I've got that geometry in place, uh, I think I'm more or less ready to uh, uh, do my thicken. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just do another trim here just to show you guys what the uh, the trim looks like when you use a sketch to do it. So let me hide this original again. I'm going to pick uh, the front plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and I'm going to create a slot. So I'm using the slot feature here to create the mouse hole. So here you can see I'm going to be creating a slot. Actually, I think I want that to be, if it's going to be more like a mouse hole, then I think this point is going to actually be here. And then what I could do is I can specify what I want the width of that to be. Maybe I'll make that like 15, 16 millimeters wide. And then I'll define how high I want that to come up uh, from the, uh, you know, on this flat spot here. So let's say I want that to come up like, I don't know, four millimeters. There we go. That looks pretty good. And now I can perform a trim command. So I go surfaces, trim. 
not using another surface, not using a plane, but actually using a sketch. So I created that sketch there in that center plane. And then here you can see I can choose to either keep or remove some of these selections. Now, here's an example of something that Jordan and I talked about a moment ago, which is if I say keep selections here, what do I end up with? I end up removing both of these. And that's really not my design intent. I don't want the back face to have that opening. I only want the front face to have that opening. So instead, when I go into that trim surface command, I'm going to say at a feature here, I'm going to say remove selections. And I'm going to just remove this region here. So sometimes it's convenience, but sometimes it's actually functional. You can't get the results you want if you use the uh, the keep option. So now we see that that's looking pretty good. I think I, I feel pretty good about the way that that model is looking. I think I'm just about ready to uh, trim or to thicken this thing. So let's turn this into a thickened model. It's nice. I don't have to go through and do that problematic corner region. So I'm going to do a thicken now. I'll say I want to thicken this out to two millimeters. I pick the surface. This is a lot like a shell command uh, when you're using traditional SolidWorks, but it's like a shell going in the other direction. So that thicken, I, I'm not sure I really like the way that this side face is looking over here. Like it, it really got funky there on that side face. And then also on the bottom, we can see that it also got pretty funky on the bottom. So what do you do in that scenario? I mean, there's a couple of different things you can do. One thing you can do is you can just take the, um, the, the planar geometry that we created earlier and then just use it again, do a cut with surface, and then just use that again to kind of cut away the bottom of the model. And that's going to leave me with a nice flat bottom that's going to be you know, much easier for my 3D printer to work with. What about the side here? I mean, there's a couple of options that we have on the side here. Uh, one thing that we can do is we could try to use a replace face command. That might be kind of fun. So we could take our side plane that we created here, our 34 millimeter uh, offset side plane. So let's call this 34 millimeter offset side plane. And uh, then what we could do is we could create an offset from there a little bit. Let's just say we offset that out like one millimeter. I think it, that'll probably do a good job of, of uh, serving us. And then we're going to create a sketch on that plane. And all we need to do is sketch a rectangle like so and choose surfaces, planar surface. So just a nice flat rectangle there. And then what we're able to do is we're able to use a command called insert face replace. And so we're able to pick one of these faces and then we're able to say we want to replace it with this surface. And what that did was it took that face that we selected and it kind of jumped it out to the location of that planar face. And so we could do a replace face again. Uh, let's just try this again. So we do replace face. Here it is. And we could say we want to take this face and we want to replace it with the surface. All right, that one had a problem. I was a little worried that might have a problem. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Let's see maybe if we do this one first. If we if we do this one here first, let's see if that works any better. So we hit the green check mark. That gives us our replace face there as well. And now let's try it one more time with that last one and see if we have any more luck now that they're they're coplanar. So we can take this face here, this face, do replace face. There we go. So what replace face does is it takes your your existing solid or surface geometry. I think actually it is solid geometry. I don't think you can do surface on surface, and it allows you to either extend or uh, uh, collapse or both. You could even do both in one shot. It allows you to extend or collapse that out to another face. And since this rectangle is planar geometry, it's, you know, it's making it really easy for us to just take all those faces and extend them right out to the rectangle. And SolidWorks is smart enough to know that that planar geometry should be extending in both directions. The cool replace thing about- Replace face is awesome. Another logically named feature, right? What yeah. does replace face do? It replaces faces. But one other yeah. place that you could use this is like with imported geometry. Once I had like a cylindrical, what should have been a cylindrical surface uh, come into the model, it wasn't cylindrical exactly. So I just made a new cylindrical surface and replaced one with the other and it was perfect. Simple I as love that. It. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and the other thing that I think is, is definitely uh, not to be overlooked and not to be understated is look at what happened to this face here. It both added and removed material. You know, and now we can actually see why I wasn't able to do them in a different order, because when we get to this face here, look at that, it's both adding and removing material. And that's really the true power of replace face mm -hmm. is that ability to, to do both in one single step. So this has gotten me out of so many jams, including the one that we just got ourselves into a moment ago. Uh, I highly recommend learning how to use that effectively, even if that's the only thing you know how to do in surfacing, even if the only thing you know how to do is you know, select a, uh, a plane to so make a plane, make a rectangular sketch, and then use that rectangular sketch to, to level out 
your model. It's like you're, you're going to, uh, you know, it's like you're running it across a planer, like a wood planer. Like you're leveling out all of the different bumps, all the different areas that are too high or that are too low. You're leveling them all out to one location. I mean, it's just so powerful and, and definitely one that I recommend everybody, you know, takes a moment to learn about uh, Replace Faces. Can't say enough about it. <laughs> so with that, um, I think that, you know, the final things we need to do, we, we flattened out the bottom here. We made the bottom look a little bit less funky, you know, a little bit easier to work with, a little bit easier to print. We set up the sides so that those are pretty good. Let's add a little bit of style to this design. Uh, so all I need to do is hide these surfaces. I don't need to delete them necessarily. I, I usually just kind of delete everything at the end so that it's ready to go off to 3D printing. Whoops. Hit the whole thing there. I'm having trouble with my uh, hide and shows uh, being a little bit less... Uh, uh, less than friendly for some reason. All right, so let's get back into edit part there. I guess we're still in edit part. Uh, mm -hmm. And yep, and let's. Uh, yeah, I'm like I'm gonna now create uh, that kind of stylized feature. So I'm gonna go here to front plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and for the stylized feature, I could really just kind of drop a circle up here wherever. You know, as long as I have enough meat down here to grab onto the model, I don't necessarily need to fully define this. It might come down to me 3D printing a couple of these things and, and uh, going through and, you know, and uh, applying uh, slight adjustments to this model. So a lot of times in those spots, I'll just write mouse button and say fully defined sketch and then let SolidWorks add the dimensions. And then if I need to adjust them later, I can. Now S key extrude cut and I'll run that through all in both directions. That gives me that kind of stylized location at the bottom. And then finally uh, going through and, you know, continuing with the stylized approach, maybe make like a 10 millimeter uh, radius here on this edge, just because I think it looks good. Uh, maybe go through and add that stress relief for the, uh, for the um, clamshell design, you know, a little bit of stress relief here in this top section. However far out that's going to come, that's something else you're going to eyeball up, see how it looks, see if it actually works. A lot of this you just have to physically test or, or run it through simulation, right? You can always run a simulation on this thing. Um, and then finally, a one millimeter stress uh, reduction fillet in these corners here. So a one millimeter fillet here, a one millimeter fillet here. And then I finish up by looking at my model tree, see if there's any bodies I don't need. If you click them here in the tree and then you press delete on your keyboard, that's kind of like going into the command insert features, delete copy. So if not, not, I'm not clicking on the feature, I'm actually clicking on the body and then I'm pressing delete and I hit the green check mark. And then I can finish up here by picking this planar face, going to the command uh, insert features mirror, right? Or, you know, just the mirror command. And then when you go to do a mirror uh, or sorry, insert pattern mirror, mirror when you go to do a mirror if you pick bodies to mirror that's kind of like a mirror all got merge solids checked on so that's going to leave me with one single solid and there we go there's our webcam cover you know we print it out we mess around with it a little bit we figure out that the mouse hole is too big and so what we could do is we could use a command called insert face move and we could take these faces here and we could tell solidworks that we just want to offset them inward by a few millimeters say five millimeters inward give us like a slightly smaller uh, mouse hole for that webcam cover you're, you're a better modeler than me toby because you remember where all those commands are on the drop down menus i have to always use the command search to find them <laughs> i mean command search is a great a great tool as well you know definitely not to be overlooked either but that's kind of the gist of what you might do if you were going through, if you were trying to create this webcam cover, if you, you know, if you have a model, really more importantly, if you have a model that you have physically modeled up at a one-to-one -one scale, and then you want to turn that, you know, you want to use that model to create some other model. A lot of times this, for me at least, this is an easier way to do it. Model the physical part, just using the features that you need, and then use that part in, in SolidWorks, that one-to-one -one digital model that you've created, to design another part in context. And that's going to be the unique part that you're going to go through that you're going to 3D print. So I think that brings that's, us to the end. Uh, I want amazing. to thank you, that thank is, you that, Jordan, so much for hosting. I'm glad you changed the, the color of it. What was that color you used for that part? Mauve? I, I've never even heard of that color before. Mauve, yeah. I don't know. That's the, I heard that somewhere probably on the internet. So fancy. Mauve. Yep, that's the mauve <laughs> color there. Looks better uh, as SolidWorks Red, though. I like it. Yeah. So mauve, yeah, well, mauve, well, when I'm editing the part, that's what's cool is that when, like, it doesn't matter what color it is originally, when I choose edit part, it becomes mauve, so I know which part I'm editing, and then all the other parts become manila, so I know, you know, that, or 
yeah, whatever, yellow. Let's just say red, pink, and yellow. So this it's part becomes pink. It's easy to tell what, what mode you're in. It's easy to tell what mode you're in. It's easy to tell which part you're editing when you've got you know multi part assembly like this. If I edit this part, it's easy to tell that I'm editing this part. I can still pick solid geometry to reference off the other parts. So it's uh, it's old school. This is the way that SolidWorks used to use colors. Uh, I love it. But but I I just like the fact that it's not blue because um, when it's blue I can't see my underdefined sketches. Yeah, very very good point. Well, Toby, I thought that was awesome. Um, it was great. There's like I, I didn't do a gr good enough job of like keeping up with all the chat commentary because so many people were giving you kudos throughout the entire thing. Yeah, I saw Garlic Trader came in. What's up, Garlic Trader? Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> yep, plenty, plenty of people giving you some love. Well, um, that concludes this today's episode of uh, SolidWorks Live Design. Remember, every single Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We're hosting some kind of live event, whether it's SolidWorks Live or SolidWorks Live Design, like you saw today. In fact, next week, if you're getting into CAD administration at like a company where there's a lot of CAD users and you're worried about like PDM administration or admin images for quicker and better managed installs and so many other things, um, that will be next week. Jeremy Regnerus will be hosting that one. And then the next SolidWorks Live design, which will be, I think it's, if I check my calendar, August 12th, um, Jeremy will be hosting another one on uh, powerful part and assembly patterns to, to model uh, a cool, what is it, timing chain for a dual overhead cam engine. Whoa. Shoot, that sounds cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, remember, <laughs> I'll tell you one more time. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and you'll get the notifications um, every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Toby, thank you so much, man. Hope you had fun. I know everyone in the audience did. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for tuning in.